the bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. About two minutes away from the end of the trading day, Katie Greifeld and Scarlett Fu counting it down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell, it's a global simulcast. We're joined now by Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. We bring together all of our audiences across television, radio, YouTube, originals, you name it, Carol. And uh, we're looks on like the moon, we're, we're on, on Mars, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. You cannot escape us, and uh, you're taking As you a look shouldn't. at the market right now. It feels like we're in a little bit of a lull. Yeah, uh, and a big lull if you look at uh, the banking sector again, right? I'm sure you guys have been talking about it. S&P joining um, uh, the other the rating agency was it Moody's? Was Moody's, it yes, yeah. Moody's? Thank you. Um, and so worries about and cutting uh, some of the uh, ratings on some of the firms within the banking sector. So you take a look at both regional banks, the KRE, it's down about 2.8 percent, and then you've got the KBW Bank Index down about two and a half percent. So this is really what's leading some of the declines, the major declines in today's overall trade. Katie, you mentioned a lull, and I wonder if the the lull is due to Nvidia happening tomorrow after the bell, or if it's you know still going to be a lull until we hear from. Uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell in Jackson Hole, Scarlett, we had Lauren Sanfilippo, Director of C Senior Investment Strategy at Bank of America, joining us a little earlier. And she talked about NVIDIA being like this macroeconomic event mm. because it's a bellwether for uh, the, the entire AI industry. It's become a bellwether for the entire AI industry, given the kind of reaction that it generated, um, not just for its own stock, but for big tech and anything tangentially tied to AI, right? I mean, we still see it with every company, including the words AI in their press release during <laughs> earnings season. Well, just about uh, 24 hours ago, until we get those results, you take a look at how markets close today. The S&P 500, we're going to finish lower, about three-tenths of a percent after that pop we saw yesterday. The Nasdaq Composite doing a little bit better, better going to close a hair higher here. Dow Jones, though, uh, the biggest loser today, off by about half a percent, it looks like, Carol. All right, so we dig a little bit deeper, uh, Katie, into the S&P 500. Most names in the index, 305 to be exact, to the downside. So certainly a risk-off trade, certainly more of that feeling in uh, the broader market. And then, Scarlett, you've got about 194 gaining, uh, gaining ground today. Yeah, and so it's definitely geared towards the decliners, and you see that reflected in the industry groups. These are the two dozen industry groups, uh, level two for the S&P 500. And on the downside, you've got banks leading the way lower, off by 2.4% as a group on that downgrade from S&P. And chip-related companies, that's NVIDIA right there, uh, the group losing 1.6%. On the upside, tech hardware, that's Apple, telecom services, uh, AT&T and Verizon, and Tesla giving the auto stocks a little bit of a lift. All right, folks, let's get to some of those individual gainers and Lo and behold, Moderna, again, atop that list. It's number two gainer in the S&P 500, number one in the NASDAQ 100, up two consecutive days. We're talking about a gain of about 12% in those days, uh, still down about 76% from its August 2021 high when it traded at 44 a share. It's 116.24 at the close today, up 4.6%. Catalyst yesterday was Moderna signing that deal to study a new cancer vaccine with the China-based uh, CarsGen. Um, this would give Moderna a second stab at cancer vaccines. So it seems like investors continue to be excited about that. Lowe's, top in the S&P 500. Uh, I guess you guys, I'm assuming, have been talking about that as well. Uh, number four gainer in the S&P. It's up 3.7% today. Second quarter comp sales and quarterly profit beat the average analyst estimate. Also slightly outperforming Home Depot, its larger competitor for the second straight quarter. So um, that was definitely some standout performance there. And Hasbro, take this, Barbie and Mattel, <laughs> uh, up about 7% in today's trade. B of A boosting their price target on the company to 90 from 85 stock closing at 67 and change so that's quite a long runway to the upside um, b of a specifically talking about success of digital games monopoly go and Baldur's hmm. gate three stock is up 12 percent year to date versus about a 20 percent gain from mattel tim but right. that again maybe, maybe we gotta have a games party. night play some of these games <laughs> of course we do all right let's go to the decliners uh schwab uh, on the other side of the s p 500 down uh close to five percent on the day today schwab down for an 11th straight day you got to go back to 2004 to find a uh, time period when uh, the companies had more consecutive down days that was back in 2004 when it was down for 16 days in a row uh, the company said it plans to reduce its operating costs i.e cut jobs 
close or downsize offices. It would save Katie at least $500 million annually uh, by making these changes. Also, Dix, we've been talking about it all day, finishing it down by 24%. The company's worst day ever. The company cut its profit outlook for the full year, dealing with slowing growth and more theft at its stores. Check out what the company's CEO had to say. The earnings for the second quarter falling short of expectations due, quote, in large part to the impact of elevated inventory shrink. That, of course, means shoplifting, employee theft, and damaged goods. What I want to know, though, is what is just, you know, people actually stealing stuff. a breakdown, stuff, right? An actual breakdown. So mm. perhaps we'll start to hear about those in the future. And the retail story continuing. Uh, Macy's down 14% today. The company comp sales beat analyst expectations, but there was a significant drop from a year ago that shows customers are, are pulling back on purchases. Uh, the question is, you know, is the consumer feeling squeezed in, in certain areas so it is pulling back on these purchases like we heard from Target, like we heard a little bit from Walmart last week as well. And what does it bode for um, the current quarter? Yeah, big questions. And of course, uh, let's get over to the bond market right now. It was a quiet day after the sell-off that we've seen. You can see that U.S. Uh, two-year yields, they did rise a little bit. That sell-off did extend at uh, the short end, but again, muted compared to the kind of moves that we've seen. You go over to the long end, it was a pretty quiet day. You had 10-year uh, one down by one basis point or so. You add it together and you did see, of course, the yield curve dip deeper into inverted territory. But again, it really feels like we're in a holding power pattern until we kick off Jackson Hole. You wonder if any of the data tomorrow will make a difference here in the sell-off that we've seen in treasuries. There's going to be new home sales, but I just refer to Cameron Kreiss's uh, entry in the MLive blog where he points out there's going to be a revision on payrolls coming out tomorrow morning, which of course is backwards looking, so I don't know that it's going to change anyone's mind. But as we, you know, really absorb this idea that the labor market is doing just fine. It's a tight labor market. Consumers are spending. If there, are, if there are revisions that show that things are actually worse than what we had been thinking, that would change maybe the, the, the framework in which we're thinking about uh, monetary policy. We've been talking about that too as well. About half a million jobs could go vanishing. But what's interesting, um, JP Morgan uh, kind of commenting on this. And even though you'd have that downward revision, you'd still see average job growth um, strong at around 300,000 payrolls a month. So it's still right showing strength in the labor force. But again, you're right, like maybe not as strong. And does that maybe make us rethink a little bit? Well, I think anecdotally, we can just look and see who's in the driver's seat right now. You know, a couple of years ago, and even last year, Katie, you had companies offering people hybrid work and allowing people to completely work from home. And just over the last year, we've seen that completely shift. And we know that what that means is the power balance has shifted, right? And that's what I'm really interested in. Of course, if we start to see the labor market become less tight, I don't want to say it's cool off because it feels like we haven't seen that at all. But some of this bargaining power on mm -hmm. the part of office workers does it go away. Well, Goldman Sachs is now tracking everyone more carefully as it tells everyone to come back into the office. Zoom, of all companies, <laughs> is the having York, people go back the into the Times office. The New York Times is doing it as well yeah. now for, for their employees, their reporters. So yeah, they're happening. coming back. Um, just want to mention Urban Outfitters crossing the Bloomberg. Uh, the retailers continue to report second quarter EPS, $1.10 a share. That seems to be a big beat. The forecast by analysts was for about $0.89 cents a share. And this is a company that has really been outperforming this year, up 45% year to date. Um, and just taking a quick check in terms of the stock in the after hours and just pulling it up on the Bloomberg, da 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 it's up about Mm, 2.3%. So a quick pop uh, after beating that second quarter uh, beat, if you will. Okay, Richard Hain, the company's CEO, saying, quote, we are proud to report second quarter sales that helped drive a 72% increase in EPS. Also gratifying is that Q2 sales strength has continued to date in Q3. So seeing the same strength in Q3 that they saw in Q2. So not seeing at least in you know the early parts of this report, the concerns that some of the other retailers have expressed. Yeah, and of course, it's interesting to keep that retailer story going. It feels like it, we don't have a really cohesive message from the retailers uh, so far this season. Maybe you guys have a different read, but it seems like it's been very idiosyncratic about mm -hmm. who's doing well and who isn't. The high end seems to be holding up just fine, and then everyone else is trading down. And if you give people a reason to buy something or go into the store or spend, uh, and it's innovative and creative enough and a little bit out there, then it gets people's attention. But yeah, I, th I think it's, it's clear that there's much more discretion now in how we spend. Here, here. Except for that $19 deodorant that Tim buys. <laughs> <laughs> that's not discretionary. That's a consumer statement. Oh, call him that's out on that's that. That's a necessity. <laughs> hey, what happens during, you know, when the mics are off stays. When, that's you know, the show I want to do. What happens when the mics are off.
Um, guys, thanks. All right, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage, wrapping up the markets on this Tuesday. Radio, TV, YouTube, and of course, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. Join us again tomorrow.